torches together is is like what do we want this badass third identity to be you know how do we like we can create anything we want together you know based on our, our gifts our relationship is our work of art exactly it's a work of art I feel like we can start every podcast with the same story. By talking about what issues trying to record the podcast brought up? By talking about, yeah, the issues that actually making a podcast as a couple, what kind of issues that brings up. And I know that to be the case because a little bit of backstory on Johnny and I. Um, we lived in a house when we first got married that was my in-laws and we were remodeling it for them, I guess. I don't really know. It's a long story, but the point I'm trying to make is that we spent three years living without a kitchen and living with roommates and living with house guests constantly. And during that time, there were a lot of triggers that were born, I think. Do you think they were born then? Or they were uh, added to, perhaps? They may have been added to. Or reinforced. Any insecurities or triggers that I had from my own childhood trying to remodel a house together that's not even your own house and you're living without heat during the winter and without a kitchen you're cooking over fire which is what we did for three years um it brings up a lot (laughs) if you can imagine and i'm trying to remember why i was even telling that story you were talking about the issues that come up when basically each time we try to start a recording right So it's sort of similar to doing a podcast together when you're remodeling a house together and living in a construction zone and living with other people as a couple, a lot of stuff comes up. And when you're doing something like recording a podcast together, it's weirdly similar. Anytime you're trying to work on something with your partner that requires your um it's a relationship yeah and in like in any relationship we each have our own specific vision of how we expect things to go how we want things to go and just by nature of being a different person my view and understanding of how i want things to go is going to be different than how you want things to go and the challenge is to marry for lack of a better term those two visions in a way that can actually produce something that is a third vision or a third it's a multiplicative one plus one equals one that yeah one times one is one so it is multiplicative (laughs) i just i uh... So we're recording the podcast again. And honestly, like, I don't know if I'm in a good emotional state to record. But part of me thinks that part of doing the podcast is being able to unearth some of these things as we go as the examples for the podcast. (laughs) So learning in public. Basically, we're learning in public and we've learned a lot of times we learned a ton through living in that scenario for we lived in that specific scenario for three years without the kitchen and then we lived with roommates for six years i think or seven years of our 10 years of marriage and we lived with tons of house guests for like four or five years of our marriage at least so that was a lot of a lot of resentment a lot of insecurities were brought up during that time and i'm realizing that the podcast is just bringing up a lot of the same ones and this time we were first trying to record 
our story and us telling our story of how we met and just who we are and what we've kind of experienced. And Johnny stopped the recording while I was telling the story to ask me if I felt like we were uh, repeating something we had already said. And for some reason, I was immediately triggered by that and immediately felt like I was maybe giving too many details that he thought I wasn't telling the story in the best way. I just had all these assumptions that maybe I, the way I'm doing it isn't good enough or something, or the way that I'm telling it isn't, um, isn't the way that he thinks it should be told. And what I can say is that whereas my question was one sentence, you heard an entire paragraph. Yeah, it's like the tip of the iceberg is the statement and then everything under the water, which is way more than the tip, uh, comes out of me because of that one little one little niche, you know, one little yeah. ding and then I'm off. I think a helpful way of looking at any conflict that is born out of a question or a concern or even a comment is to try to identify what's the paragraph that a, that one sentence elicits in your partner. I know there's certain sentences I can say. S some will elicit a paragraph. Some will elicit an entire page. Or story book. <laughs> and ultimately, my sentence, my one sentence, is oftentimes all there is, as far as I'm concerned, just the one sentence. It's a simple question of, hey, what about this? And, you know, I know for myself, there are questions you can ask me, concerns you can express that will bring up a whole amount, a huge amount of past triggers, traumas, experiences, difficult things, that all are ultimately insecurities. Yeah. And my general rule for conflict is that it always at the root of every conflict is one or more person's insecurity. And I can't think of any situation where that isn't true. I'm open to the possibility that there are situations where that's not the case, but until I come across one, I'm going to keep going with this rule. And it's interesting how we've worked through a lot of them and yet they can still sometimes come back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in this case, you and correct me if I'm wrong, because I want to make sure I'm portraying your point of view as accurately as possible. But my understanding is that you felt my questioning the storytelling brought up insecurities of feeling like you don't know what's best you don't know what you're doing you basically deferred to my authority automatically because most of the feedback you've received in your life has been you're not smart you don't know what you're doing you can't handle that let me do it you know, all these things that come out of childhood experiences with your parents in school, all these other things that have nothing to do with me, ultimately. Yeah, you weren't there. <laughs> I've said before to you that marriage is super unfair because as partners, we have to deal with all of the baggage from the rest of your life I have to deal with the consequences of the way other people treated you and you have to deal with the consequences of the way other people treated me. And that's not fair because ultimately it's not your fault that other people in my life when I was a child treated me certain ways and established certain patterns in my life, taught me certain things, habituated me in certain ways. But ultimately by agreeing to enter into the relationship with you, I am agreeing to take that on much as if you had debts monetary debts that you brought into the relationship I feel like I would have had you I mean you actually had more money when we got married than I did neither of us had much at all no I mean we were 20 
but <laughs> to be fair, we did get married at the end of a snowboard season. So that's when I was due to start working again. That's when you were had totally drained your. Yeah. You've always been good at saving money. We both have, really. Um, but anyway, there's a lot of baggage. There's a lot of debts. There's a lot of deficits that we all bring to a relationship, as well as it's good not to forget about all the gifts, all the blessings, all the abundance that we each bring to a relationship as well. Well, I guess that kind of leads me to thinking about the fact that one of my biggest insecurities is my intelligence because in school I didn't get terrible grades, but I definitely was like a straight C student, maybe with an A and, and, you know, PE (laughs) like everybody. Um, and you know, maybe a D here and there, not like maybe a few B's. Okay. But for the most part, like I averaged as a C student. So I didn't feel really like I was very good at this. And a lot of the feedback I got was that I wasn't very intelligent in that way. And that might be just me reading into things as a child, but that was the insecurity that was built. And so when I met you and especially after getting married and finding out that your IQ is off the charts and I think I was naturally attracted to you because you had this piece of me that had always been such an insecurity. Like your intellect was attractive to me because it felt like it completed me in a way. But the very thing that was a gift, like your intellect is a gift to my life. Your intellect helps me even feel confident enough in putting out a podcast because um, I'm learning to trust a different kind of intellect in myself, which is different from yours. Um, But your intellect was a gift to me as well as a possibility for many triggers because I can assume that you're talking down to me sometimes, or I can assume that when you say something that I don't understand that I am stupid, you know, because I don't understand it. And so there's like a lot of opportunities for me to be triggered by the very thing that is also a gift and the very thing that is also why I was attracted to you in the first place. So I think it's interesting because a lot of times we are attracted to things in other people that originally feel like a part of us that was disowned and later on we start to not like that part of our partner anymore because we are being triggered by it and it turns into something different from the original attraction. When I first met you, it was clear to me that you possessed an intelligence. And it's not the intelligence that is easily measured by school. I think school, public school at least in my experience, tend to, tends to measure one, it tends to measure the easily, most easily measured type of intelligence, which is essentially rote memory. The ability to take in information and regurgitate it in this way that it was taken in. And that for me is super easy. And I remember as a kid thinking it was so weird that I was rewarded in school for something that required practically no effort. Whereas all these other kids were trying so hard at the same thing. And were, I watched the system beat them down and give them negative feedback and tell them they were stupid. And the only refuge for a lot of kids was sports. So you either had to be good at sports. And if you were good at sports, then the teachers would let you slide in your classes, at least certain teachers. And otherwise, it was all up to your memory. And... I see, maybe for some kids, we're able to make up for not as good of a rote memory with working really, really hard. Um, but anyway, I back to what I was saying. When I met you, it was clear to me that you had an intelligence. Uh, you have an emotional intelligence that I admire big time. 
and you know you have an ability to read people to understand how they're feeling to understand why they're feeling that way potentially um, you have an insight into the workings of the emotions that I feel like maybe my leaning toward rote memory perhaps more of the circuitry of my brain goes that direction and more of your circuitry goes the other and doesn't really have as much use for the rote memory and the more we get into the age of the internet the less useful the rote memory is anyway so i'll just become obsolete no pretty soon, <laughs> pretty soon here but we're seeing how like our insecurities actually our gifts ultimately. Yeah. I mean, one of my insecurities has been that I'm not an emotional person and I am an emotional person. So the insecurity isn't that I'm not, it's that I fear that, that I'm not, perceived. or I, I fear that I'm perceived as not as a non-emotional person because of the way I process my emotions. Well, it's the same thing as like me not feeling intellectual. <laughs> I've been like, even Sometimes when I'm recording the podcast and I say the word like too much or I don't say something exactly how I feel like I want to communicate it, I can immediately be triggered by that insecurity. Like even just now for a moment, you know, that I'm not well spoken enough or something. Yeah. It comes up all the time. A marriage proposal is essentially asking someone do you want to systematically work through all of our insecurities together? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Does that sound fun to you? Uh, it's so true, though. But on the other side, it's incredibly freeing to realize that so many of the insecurities don't align with anything that we could call real. Yeah. In life. And they're all just fears and anxieties born out of childhood experiences. And they're programmed into our brain in such intense ways. The more we, ha the more we were reinforced by some kind of event that caused the insecurity, um, the more it's going to take time to undo it in our, in our brains and in, in, in our full body, actually. I mean, um, yeah, the physiological response is huge and yeah, very real. It just, and I mean, even, even last night, I feel like we're going to be doing a sex episode soon, but I feel like I can bring this up right now. But even last night, I had a trigger from the past in, in a sexual way. And I think a lot of women and even probably men have these triggers based on an actual scenario that happened where the the memory gets replayed in that moment because of the stimuli that's happening and the way that it's happening reminds us of that moment. And then our bodies immediately go into a state of shock. They, all those chemicals flood our bodies and make us feel like we're actually in the same situation that we were back then. And I, I had a very healing moment last night where I allowed Johnny to love me through the insecurity. Not, I didn't even say anything to him, but I could sense that something changed at at some point and required a certain a, a, a slight change in approach more patience more it required me to be attentive yeah and to be delicate in because the trigger itself comes from a time where there wasn't that attention there wasn't that patience there wasn't that understanding built with the person that this happened with and there was actually full-on um, verbal abuse basically after it happened. And it's something that I haven't thought about for a really long time, but you could say that the perfect storm happened and all of a sudden I was back there 
in that place. And I was, and I'm having an experience with you who you're my husband. I've been married to for 10 years. I know you love me. Like I know all these things. And yet that memory can just trigger that experience so quickly that all of a sudden you're not my husband. You don't love me. Like it, because I'm, I'm transported. I'm not in the same space even. Sometimes it feels like you legitimately transport when you are triggered by an insecurity or a, a trauma. Yeah, I think perhaps w one of the most important things in those moments when one or one or more people in the relationship is triggered is for the I guess I would say receiving party, but that doesn't, but basically if your partner is triggered, the most important thing is to not take it personally because then what starts with a sentence gets amplified to a paragraph on the other end. And then that in turn, if I take that personally, then I can amplify in, I can create my own paragraph. You know, I say something to you, it triggers you. I can tell you're feeling a certain way. And then I take that personally, and then I can start to feel resentful. I mentioned it in one of our other podcasts that things can get kind of blown up into like out of proportion to where what actually started the whole sequence gets lost. And all of a sudden there's a full blown conflict where before there was what started it was a simple, innocent question. And you know, there have been times in our relationship where I felt like I was being punished for, like I said earlier, someone else's action. Something I did or said reminded you of something that someone did or said to you in the past. And then the negativity or the, the challenge that brought up in you then fe feels unfair to me. It feels like I'm being attacked. Like, I didn't say that. That's not what I meant by that. You know, I didn't mean anything by that. I just asked a simple question. You know, why am I, why do I now have to go through this entire ordeal just for asking a question? But I think that's the agreement that we enter into when we make a commitment. Or at least that's the agreement we ought to be agreeing to when we make a commitment, knowing ahead of time that you're going to be working through your insecurities with the other person. At some point, I think in high school, I had this realization, and I think it's one of those realizations that isn't a, a limited just to me. It's probably a, real, it's a realization lots of people have probably had. But I realized that our personality and every person's personality is the way they live out their insecurities in the world. Like what I know of a certain person is their response to the things they feel insecure about. And the most enjoyable people to be around in my experience are those that are least terrified of their insecurities. But that's yeah. either something that is born out of incredible luck in that you just, you go through life and for some reason or another, you don't develop all those insecurities or it's something that is the result of a lot of awareness and reflection and hard work and learning ultimately. Yeah, so what, what can people do in the midst of, I mean, we uh, we talked about in our first episode, uh, conscious conflict, a bit about how to work with these things. But when insecurities arise and things are getting heated, what can a couple do? I think starting with questions is a really good place to begin. Well, and for me personally, I'll say that sometimes I definitely need to go spend time alone. Absolutely. Yeah. If there just needs to be some distance between the trigger and the discussion, then I think that needs, that took me a while to learn to allow that and not panic during that time. 
during that gap of time between the conflict and the discussion. Because that was part of your insecurity, probably. Yeah, as a person pro to codependent behavior, I think uh, Whitney Cummins described it as an inability to al- to see anyone in pain around you. And so a codependent person will do anything they can to try to make the pain around them go away. Yeah. And that often means sacrificing myself to try to make it. It's a, it's a discomfort with others' discomfort. Well, and the more you and I have been able to be uncomfortable together in our, in our conflicts and when we have insecurities come up, it, the better, actually. So when you just allow me to go and take time alone and usually because in the moment I am having so many like legitimate chemicals in my body changing my state and how I feel, I don't know if I can always have the conversation that needs to happen in the moment. And I don't know a lot of people who can. I think with insecurities especially because you're being triggered by something that happened in the past usually – um, you have to go and get out of that state again so you're not in the past and come back and have the conversation in the present. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah, you have to take the time to explore a bit, get curious. That's something we've said many times and we'll probably say many more times is get curious. If some, If your partner says something and it triggers a incongruous response within you that's a good time to take a take a step back and say wow what what's going on here why did that what was it about that statement that phrase that comment that has elicited such a large response within me and just sit with that for a bit and i mean i'll say psychoanalysis and by that i mean looking back to the childhood experience as a way of understanding our present experience has been a super helpful tool for us. And at this point, I feel like I almost have the skill set to break apart any conflict into its component pieces and analyze it. The danger of that is that I can over intellectualize any conflict and miss out on and what might be spiritual bypassing in one instance becomes intellectual bypassing. If I can just apply some philosopher or therapist theory to it and be like, oh, well, actually what's going on is this, 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 and this. And it's not, you know, and that totally overlooks what's the intense emotional aspects of it. And so that's the danger that we've, both of us and me particularly, have had to be very careful of and acknowledge. I think I read in a book the other day that um, humans can't be formulized. You can't put them into a formula. Yeah, that would just go for the whole universe. (laughs) But so often we try to come up with a formula to how to do this. And it's part of the reason why we've been recording our podcasts in conversation form. Because if I have an outline or I try to formulize even what I'm doing, it it steals the the authenticity of it for me. And so in conflict, I don't really want to turn to some formula or some like breakdown of the conflict into the intellectual parts because for me, I'm feeling so much and I'm experiencing so much that I just need to ride those waves and like let them take me where I need to go to experience the healing that I obviously am needing at that moment. But it requires each person to know themselves. So that's kind of the first step is if you don't know, if you're not willing to go on that adventure of curiosity with yourself first to understand these triggers, then it's going to be hard to communicate to your partner what you really need from them in those moments if you don't know. And each conflict is an opportunity to discover those things. I think we said that in the first podcast seeing your conflicts and seeing these insecurities as times where we can um, learn something new about ourselves and about our partner so that we can better love them and better love ourselves. (laughs) 
if we think of ourselves as being represented by a map that shows the the territory of our being with all of its mountains and valleys and rivers and trees and forests and all that when we meet somebody we will open up the map a couple folds perhaps and show them the parts of the territory that we're most comfortable with um, the parts we've explored the parts we're familiar with and that we feel like sh uh, show us in a good light and the more we get into our relationship we will take the risk of opening an, one more fold of that map you know the maps that you get them open and then they're very difficult. You can't figure out how the heck Old you, school maps. Yeah. You open them up and then there's so many folds. You can't even figure out how to get them back to fit in their little package. So you open a fold and how your partner responds to the revealing of that part of the territory is going to have a huge play, a huge role in determining whether you feel safe to then expose more and more of the map. You're explorers basically together of, of that territory. Yeah. So I feel like as we've gotten deeper into our relationship, you've been willing to take the risks to open parts of the map that you probably have not ever shown to anyone else. You know, I've had been privy to parts of your being that no one else gets to see. And my ability to take a look at those and respond with love, with understanding, with patience, and even with delight is going to kind of invest in that, in that account of trust that we have, which could lead us off on a whole nother conversation and will lead us <laughs> off on a whole nother conversation. It, it makes me think of this other idea or I guess on the other side of it, because it doesn't always go that way where, where you're, we're open my map and there's a territory being exposed and you're giving me love and uh, support and all those things. Even if you are giving me all those things, when I expose that part of myself, my insecurities sometimes are so strong that I expect you to respond badly because that is the insecurity sometimes is that somebody else responded badly to that part of me. And so I put that expectation on you or I project that onto you. And I think if I show Johnny this, he's not going to accept me. And I've said that about a lot of things. I've been like, if if I act this way, Johnny's going to think I'm stupid or Johnny's going to not understand why I want to do this. And I just, I am, my insecurities block that from even happening sometimes. Well, you wrote a, about on the blog, I think, how our expectations of each other can hold us back. Totally. That by, if you assume Johnny's not going to accept this, so I'm not going to show it to him then I'm not even given the opportunity to prove you wrong. And then I might get mad that you don't accept me for who I am, but I'm not, I'm not able to show you who I am because of that. Yeah. That could be a whole nother conversation and likely will be. Yes, for sure. It's hard not to just keep going and going and going <laughs> and going. <laughs> That's the great thing about a podcast though, is so many episodes you can do. <laughs> yes. And they all just seem to weave together. Like I said, it's hard to formulize a human being. You can't really put a formula to a person. You can't give everybody the same advice. And so having conversations about these things is the best way I can think of to, to bring it up and, and talk through how we've processed through stuff. And then just hopefully those stories can be um, helpful in stimulating how you might want to go about it, you being the person listening. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> These conversations are a huge part of the way that we've grown our relationship to what it is today. I mean, honestly, the first time I mentioned doing a podcast to Johnny, uh, specifically a relationship podcast, we were sitting in our living room for the hundredth night in a row, just talking with each other about our thoughts and 
philosophy and self-development, all the things that we enjoy talking about. And I was like, we should just record these conversations because I think I think they'd be helpful. I hope so. We process through things so much together that we wanted to share those processes with people. Yeah. I spent a long part of my life telling people things they didn't care to hear. <laughs> so the nice thing about a podcast is if someone's not interested, they can just turn it off. Exactly. Without uh, offending me. Yes. Because I won't know. <laughs> So, yeah, take inventory of your insecurities as they arise and be loving with yourself. I think as children, when the the way we formed our insecurities is when we felt like we weren't given love or we were um, maybe reprimanded for something that we we did. And I know as a child, there were times where I felt like I was being reprimanded for something that wasn't wrong, but something that my guardians or even people that watched me, even babysitters decided that they thought was wrong. You know, their own, their own idea of how I should act and not my own way of being. And so I think we are trying to come into our true authentic nature in marriage and in partnership and we have been wounded by people in our past who didn't allow us to come out in that way. And marriage is this beautiful opportunity for that. But if, if we are unable to do that in this relationship, then it can be a re-wounding for a second time sometimes. And Johnny and I have definitely re-wounded each other many, many times, but we've also healed each other many, many times. And that's the beauty of it. it there's there's light and dark in it, but it's been such a beautiful experience to um, feel more and more understood and seen and loved by Johnny in a way that I haven't experienced before in my life. That like my authentic self is actually loved in its entirety. And that is a beautiful experience to have. Absolutely. Don't, scorn the challenges the conflicts the difficulties in plumbing one technique for looking for leaks in certain systems is to inject a little bit of dye into the system and then you can see where that dye shows up where it's so it makes it more obvious and i think the conflicts in our relationship are sort of showing us where the leaks are and to just get pissed off if we if those come up it just allows the leaks to just continue whereas if we can see them and say huh okay there's something going on here let's take a look at it you know and let's tread lightly let's be delicate let's be patient let's not force it because if something comes up there's likely some tenderness there that needs to be treated with with love and with 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 tenderness tenderness needs tenderness and yeah when those things show up they can be they can be mined for for so many gems we're giving each other the thing that we didn't necessarily get not that i feel like my parents you know blew it or something they my parents are both loving you, people you made it this far but you know, everybody has that experience where they weren't fully able to show up as who they are. And as adults, that's when we get this opportunity to really show up as who we are. And our partner can play an integral part in that. And they can give us the gift of that unconditional love that and that um, ability to see us that we haven't experienced from someone else. And they can't they can't be everything to us. I want to I want to make sure that that is stated because ultimately in the past people lived in community. And so you're going to get different needs met outside of your relationship as well. They're not going to take on everything, but yet another conversation, yet another conversation. But so, yeah, we can leave on that note. I think that's a good note to lead on. Absolutely. 
and thanks for being patient with me. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, what, do you not think I have ever needed you to be patient with me? <laughs> oh, you're just saying it. As just in general, a, yeah. In general. <laughs> well, yeah. um, I mean, that's great if you can't think of any examples, but <laughs> I, well, beg, I beg to differ. I can say that I'm also very grateful for how much healing you've brought into my life. And I know I haven't always been easy to work with. And, but I love myself through that and you've loved me through that. And that's what has caused the change and the growth is when there is, when we put less and less shame on ourselves for, for, for being human and for working through stuff. I mean, this is what we are. It's, it's reality is what we have to do. You know, don't beat yourself up. Don't beat your partner up. Just don't beat anyone up. Don't beat people up. No one deserves to be beat up. Awesome. Well, guys, keep making your relationship a work of art. And if you want to support our podcast, please subscribe or leave us a little review about. Or share it with friends that you think might. Yes, like sharing it. it with friends would be awesome. Yeah, that's the best way to. Or let us know it. why you think it sucks and <laughs> how we might make it better. <gasps> okay, this is Torches Together, Johnny and Bailey River signing off. Signing off. Mm-hmm.